Uh, Mori na koutou. Uh, good morning. Kuanaru uh, great tēnei. My name is Anaru, and I have been presenting the story about Kohuiro, uh, the kopapa or the topic about Kohuiro in the first session or first chapter. And so in that chapter, I basically spoke about the history of negotiations for the mana or sovereignty of Aotearoa. And uh, I talked about the uh, Kohuiro itself, uh, also the early intervention and the chiefs from the north that visited England, uh, meeting with um, the, the Crown of England uh, and uh, King George the the Fourth, um, King William the Fourth, or petition that went to King William, also by the Northern Chiefs, and also talked a little bit about the flag of the sovereign nation and trade and the lead up to the Declaration of Independence. I just wanted to mention, and because I showed this um, uh, front cover of a magazine, and I did mention, I think it was 80, uh, 1982, but it was actually 2002 when this uh, magazine came out. And um, so there was uh, many presentations uh, done around uh, different uh, rohe or different um, uh, areas with uh, iwi uh, at Marae, and so uh, I'm going to do short, um, short clips or short posts or um, sessions about kupira. Um So today um, I've got a, a, a PowerPoint slide, and so I can just give you a little bit about. Um, so I, I spoke about the establishment. Uh, partnership for the future, um, early trade, industry of Māori and the origins of the trade um, and that was um, from crown to crown and and meeting with the, the Crown of England. Um, today I'm going to just continue with that, I'll just put that up and uh, uh, right. So the registering of Māori owned ships, um, so the flag enabled ships built in New Zealand to be registered, but its significance to Māori was wider. They saw it as a recognition of the mana of uh, New Zealand, so that the declaration grew out of another perceived annexation attempt by the French. Uh, the colonial office in England acknowledged the declaration and the king promised protection for the Māori people as long as it was consistent with and due regard to the just rights of others and to the interests of His Majesty's subjects. The declaration was initially signed uh, by 34 Northern Chiefs and uh, by July 1839 uh, they had 52 signatures and that last signatory was Portato Te Whero Whero from Waikato. So Māori saw as a cornerstone of this declaration and the flag um, the cornerstone of the 1840 treaty. I won't go into the treaty right now, but I'll also talk about uh, there was a Kohi Marama conference in 1860, and it gave clarifications to the right uh, to the wider ramifications um, achieved by the government in 1860. And so this was held in Kohi Marama by 200 chiefs. Kohi Marama is in Auckland, obviously. Um, but I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the historian Kuria Orange, who notes that among Māori, there was no um, no issue uh, attitude towards the treaty, and that the Kohi Marama Conference came to serve a quite different functions for the officials and for the Māori people. Uh, you see, back then the government saw it was uh, important to counter the growing kingi. Kingi Tanga movement or the King movement um, in Waikato. But the chief saw it as a confirmation that under the treaty their mana had been guaranteed. So Māori tr tradition confirmed uh, by the Taiopudu, so the Taiopudu is connected to Kohuiro, um, and uh, the uh, Komato at the time was Maui Pumari, uh, takes the story of negotiations between the chiefs and the British government. Even further back than Hongi's visit to King George IV in 1820. 
It is said that from about 1808, chiefs were talking to the governor of New South Wales about Māori ships and trade in British colonies and elsewhere. The chiefs who undertook the negotiations were Waikato Wharehere, the great-great-grandfather of Taiopuru, from Hawke's Bay, Hohipera from Northland, and Tiki Tiki, his other name was Te Horeta, from Kaipara. These negotiations were formalised in 1830 by a petition sent by Waikato, Tiki Tiki, and another chief, Tipuna, whose other name was Wirumu Pohepohe, to King George III. And an assurance was given that Māori-owned ships could trade under Crown rights. <clears throat> so William IV subsequently gave his consent to Acts of Parliament in 1831, and in later years, which made these assurances legal provisions. Uh, in return, British and other ships were given free landing rights. I want to make mention also that, um, uh, as I mentioned there, there were assurance uh, of um, consents of Acts of Parliament uh, that were giving assurance to Māori or to the Ariki or chiefs. So um, I'm going to put up a post uh, about uh, the Minister Doug Graham. He was the Minister of Justice, I think, around about 1995. And he put a post in the New Zealand Herald and Waikato Times. And the post, if I can recall, goes like this. Uh, Pākehā need to understand that there are two laws, one for Pākehā and one for Māori. So the laws for Māori um, were there prior to many of the um, migrants, I suppose, to Aotearoa and prior to the establishment of the New Zealand government. So as I go through the history of the story about Kohuira, I will be bringing up certain uh, certain aspects that indicate that there were uh, laws put in place to protect Māori rights and to protect Māori land. Okay, um, so William IV sub subsequently gave his consent to Acts of Parliament in 1831. Okay, so in return, British and other ships were given free landing rights. Um, before 1835, tall poles decorated with feathers marked landing places. The feathers showed which chief guaranteed the safety of the chiefs. After the gazetting of the flag in 1835, both flag and feather poles stood on the beach. But with the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, the Union Jack replaced the feather poles. The custom service collected dues previously paid to the chiefs. So what I'm also going to indicate that there, was, there were uh, institutions that were set up um, by the government that took over the systems that were put in by the Ariki. So the customs service, and you can look at customs like immigration, passports, and visas and all that kind of stuff, they basically took over uh, what was actually being um, given to the chiefs in, in terms of the services that, that they were providing. Okay, so when... Hongi met George IV. He spoke not only about landing rights and trade, but also about the need for a treaty to control Europeans taking land. So, um, as you can mention there, there were things that the chiefs were trying to put in place to not only protect their sovereignty and protect their uh, their mana, but uh, but also uh, to protect to protect their lands. In 1831, a petition to William IV reinforced this. The 13 chiefs who signed it spoke not only about their own tribes, but also about many tribes in other parts of the country. Um, in 1832, Paratene Temanu of Ngāti Wai and Ngā Titoki led a delegation to England to see King William IV. A meeting with King William took place in Portsmouth. Temanu gave him a carved paddle and after the granting of the flag a dog skin cloak he wore as a chief. Okay, so there is re definitely recognition of Māori sovereignty. 
international trade invitations, trading of ship uh, building. So uh, when it was realized that uh, our kodi, our trees here in Aotearoa, were quite strong and sturdy and really, really good for um, the sailing ships, there was this trade going on as well. Um, and obviously, there was a contract between the two sovereigns, the Crown of England and the uh, sovereignty of Aotearoa. Um, I'm going to talk about these in the next session. It's about the two crowns, and I will talk about the British Crown uh, sovereignty line and also the Kohuero Taiopuru line, which was linked to Kohuero back in 1808. So um, I will talk about this at the next session. And uh, so I want to thank you for watching and listening and looking forward to the third chapter of Kohuero. Anyway, um, apart from that, may uh, peace be with you always and have a great day.